Okay, well, um, thank you for inviting me. I was supposed to be here, I think it was 2013, and I uh, no-showed at the last minute. So I'll take this as an opportunity to apologize. I had a pretty good excuse. I fell down and shattered my jaw, rotated the mandible out. My mouth was wired shut. And so if I had come to do the talk, I would have been A, high as fuck on oxycodone. So it would have been interesting. And I would have also been torpor for a just Anyway, so, um, so some stuff. Um, I, I should give you some disclaimers. This is, this is all, of course, just my opinion. I've been sitting inside this industry now for a long time, and my job is to sort of watch industry trends, mostly so that I can try to figure out how to make a lot of money on them, uh, which I have not done a very good job of. So you can take everything I say at, with a grain of salt, if you wish, because I can, obviously could be quite wrong. This has been my view of optimism of security, and I've noticed it in a lot of people who come into the field um, I remember, for example, I, I should have actually had a node on here, which is a separate line, which is the cryptography will solve everything, um, which most people, when they start to approach security, go through a very brief page, they go, uh, brief phase, they go and buy, uh, they go and buy Bruce Schneier's books, and then they go, oh, well, we'll just add crypto to everything, it'll be fine. Even Bruce did that. And then after a while, they go, oh, well, wait a minute, it's more complicated. Uh, and then things wind up, things wind up maturing. And, and from where I'm sitting right now, um, uh, I, I will also tell you, I, I wrote these slides on the plane on the way out, so they're, they're fairly up to date. So I'm not, I'm not calling the IOT out as a big disaster because, of, because I, I was surprised by what happened to Brian Krebs's site, and, and, you know, that kind of thing. This, this is all something that should have been intuitively obvious to any of us. If you're going to field billions of devices with no security model, um, you're, you're just not very smart. Um, but that, that's kind of the problem here, right? Because in security, we have a lot of smart people who are trying very hard to do a very difficult thing. Building secure systems is difficult. Building reliable systems is difficult. Now, now that, in a nutshell, is going to be the, the gist of what I'm going to be talking about. Because I don't see a difference between secure systems and reliable systems. I spend a huge amount of my time screaming at executive management of various companies to try to get them to take security more seriously. And in the last five years, I've shifted from trying to, trying to sell security or trying to get people to take security seriously by telling them, you know, you're going to be on the front page of the New York Times with the leak of a million credit cards. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but nobody really gives a shit about that. Right? We're at the point now where everybody's credit card information is leaked several times. <laughs> All of your personal information is leaked several times. The only, there, there are probably five people in the United States whose personal information is not leaked onto the internet, and they were just born two minutes ago. Um, it, it, oh, sorry, one of them just leaked. Um, you know, so we need to not worry about that. So I talk to management and I tell them, you need to take this seriously, and they say, cost-cutting, expense, blah, 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 difficult, right? Yes. But here's the part that I don't understand, is a, a great deal of corporations, corporate management, are quite comfortable with the idea that we're going to build the redundant internet paths, we're going to have redundant routers, we're going to have redundant servers, we're going to, we're going to do all of these things that allow us to build reliable computing infrastructures, except for the security part. And what they don't seem to understand, and this is the pitch that I've been giving them, is you know, the reason that you want to take security seriously is because it really doesn't matter how many redundant internet connections you've got if they're all DDoSed. So you need to actually factor DDoS in as a normal failure mode of internet communications, just like, whoops, a squirrel ate my router, you know, well, not the squirrels don't eat routers, but, you know, a squirrel chewed through my fiber optic cables, which, you know, um, as you know, squirrels are one of the major threat models for the internet, uh, at least in, in, in the U.S. Anyway, so the current trend is that management wants us to do more with less, which is a fundamentally stupid idea if you think about it. And actually what you should be doing if you're, if you're working for a normal corporation is you should be trying to do more with more. If you look at the capitalist model for most corporations, the idea is that our company is going to grow infinitely and that we're going to get finally to the point where Amazon.com eats the entire planet. Of course, every company thinks that they're going to do that. 
every company. Shareholders think that they're going to do that, which is why all large corporations are inherently in competition with each other. But, but when you step aside from the, the foolishness of capitalism, uh, the basic premise is you're going to have to do more with more, which means you're going to grow, but management doesn't want to do that. The other thing that I keep trying to get to emphasize is that it's, 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 it's about people, not process, but the current model is we're going to do everything with process, not people. So we want to, the executive management, most, certainly in the US, most companies want to reduce the headcount so that they can impact their bottom line profitability because they see staff as a recurrent cost, right? They want to replace all of us with something that simply consumes electricity, which is, you know, not a bad idea, um, but it, it's, it's not going to work. The other, the other thing that management wants as part of achieving that synergy is to use off-the-shelf software wherever possible. So development is a big, a big no-no. Now I happen to think that's a ridiculous idea. I'll explain why. And then they don't want to have an in-house development capability. This is fascinating to me. I mean, I'm sure there's some of you in the room who have realized how utterly stupid this is. But the whole drive to outsourcing everything in the U.S., especially in the public sector, is is behind. It, that's what's behind it. We don't want to have an in-house development capability. So the National Security Agency, for example, has stopped really doing very much development. It's all done by Booz Allen Hamilton for them. <laughs> How's that working, right? I mean, it's working very well. It's working very well for Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, you, you, always have to, you always have to look and figure out where's, where are things actually working, right? This, is, this has been a very difficult thing for me to acknowledge and to face during the course of my life. But when you see a lot of people doing something utterly stupid, and you go, well, that's completely dumb. Why, why are they doing that? The only reason that this can happen is if they're not using the same reasons that you are, which means that there's probably some other motivation that you simply haven't understood yet. So when you see something like the US government outsourcing all of the things that should be part of its internal critical IT infrastructure, outsourcing them, what, what, why are they doing that? And then you realize, oh, it's not actually to make anything better. It's just to make the contractors richer. Oh, that makes, that makes everything clear all of a sudden, right? So I am advocating the opposite in pretty much every situation of where all of the trend lines in the computing in, uh, IT industry are going, which is difficult. That's why I feel like I need to throw a disclaimer out there because a lot of what I'm saying, if you talk to a typical corporate executive, a lot of what I'm saying is completely stupid. I'm saying, no, oh, you know, you don't want to reduce your staff. You don't want to buy that $60,000 one U high rack mount guaranteed uh, machine learning um, malware detection thingamadig. Because it's actually not going to work. I mean, it, it's, well, it's going to work. It's going to work for the people who sold that thing to you for $60,000. It's not going to work for you. Right? And again, I don't want to raise anyone's blood cynicism level to the point where, where people start to pass out. But, what you need to understand is that the computer security industry does not exist to secure your systems. We do not exist to solve your problems. We do not exist to make your life better. We exist to take your money. That's what we're here to do. If we manage to make your security a little bit better as, a process, as part of that process, that's a good thing, but it's just an accident. It's, it's just simply because in order to take your money, I have to be a little bit better than the other guy standing next to me who's doing the same thing. So, so there's this evolutionary, there's a very slight evolutionary pressure towards actually doing something that works in order to take your money. Um, but, but the stuff that I'm talking about is actually things that de-emphasize that aspect of things, which is the, the things that are good for customers, which would be the things that would build your security better. And so essentially my, my attitude and my approach is, is anti-industry, anti-commercial, which is you know, ironic because I'm part of the industry. What are you going to do? Okay. So here's the problem. Management is chasing all these fads. I, I call them fads. And it's a problem also of false optimism. And, and it, it's, a, it's, a two, it's a two factor problem, right? So management sits there and they read the, the magazine and the seat back in United Airlines flight, whatever. And they see, oh, well, everyone's going to the cloud. All my golf buddies are going to go to the cloud. Oh my God, I've got to go to the cloud too. Now, I'm not saying cloud is implicitly bad, it's just a thing, right? But they go, oh, they come back and they, that's the level of thought that they've put into it in a lot of cases. 
Although usually what's happening in, in corporate management now is that most corporations have a smart person or a small number of smart people who are the go-to guy for that organization. And that's really the person who is the decision former and the CTO, CIO, are the people who consult those individuals who form the decision for the CIO, CTO, and then the CIO, CTO comes forward and says, I'm the big visionary. And you know, those, those people, are, those people are, are extremely powerful in the industry. There's probably a few of them in this room. I have been one of them at various times in my life. But those are the people who really make the policy, and if those people are wrong, then you get these completely bizarre things. Um, but anyway, so, the idea is, let's just buy the next anti-malware $60,000 1U high thing, maybe it'll work this time. That's, it hasn't worked in 20 years, but maybe this time it will suddenly start to work. Right? Maybe that will work. Oh, I know, big data. Hey, you know, big data is good, right? So, because it's big, so maybe that'll work, so let's do big data. Um, you know, whatever, right? Let's push, let's push data sharing, maybe data sharing is good. Maybe that's going to work. Right? So we're in the middle of all of these weird fads. And one of the things that, that I get frustrated about when I think about the, you know, in, in the, the diet industry is unfortunately the closest industry I've seen to the way that com the computer security industry works, which is, which is really depressing. And in the US, we spend way more money on diet foods than we do on our space program, which is also kind of depressing. And no, I'm not going to talk about US politics. Uh, I, I have to, you know, I have to say, I have to say, getting off the airplane, it started the minute I got off the airplane. I got off the airplane in Copenhagen, went through the, went through the little petty nationalism display and showed them my passport, and the guy behind said, oh, so what do you think of your new president? <laughs> like, two seconds I was on the ground and people already making fun of us. Basically, we Americans went, we took a look at the British who did their Brexit thing, and we went, oh, oh. Y'all hold my beer, I'm gonna show you something. <laughs> anyway, um, <coughs> okay. Uh, and I live in Pennsylvania. Uh, okay, so um, we spend all of this money on diet, fad diet foods, when the second law of thermodynamics tells us that there are always two ways to be, to be smaller, not necessarily thinner, but smaller, which is to burn more and take in less, right? So we will do anything except burn more and take in less. There's no amount of money we won't spend. So if you want to make a billion dollars in America, all you have to do is come up with something where you can claim that you can eat five gallons of Ben and Jerry's a day and still lose weight and you'll make all the money. Computer security is the same way. If you want to make all the money in computer security, come up with something like big data, which coincidentally was, was an idea that was cooked up by the people who sell hard drive arrays. Um, but you come up with an, an idea like that that basically means you can collect all your data that you should be thinking about and analyzing and, and you won't actually have to think about it and analyze it, right? That's the premise behind, behind big data. Not that I'm saying there's anything necessarily wrong with big data. There's things that you can do with it, but the people who are buying it don't understand the actual things that you can't do with it, which is again, kind of ironic. So this is the problem. Management is chasing fads. Management doesn't understand frickin' anything about anything that matters, which is, again, bizarre, because we're at the tail end where the executive management of most corporations, at least in the US, are still baby boomers, right? So these are people who, who were you know, born and raised in the 60s, or born in the 50s and raised in the 60s. They're as out of touch as it's possible to be. And here's the crazy part, is that the visionaries among those incredibly out of touch managers are also getting, you know, the 25-year-old the snot-nosed web kid who doesn't understand anything about computing, not because they're ignorant, but because they haven't been around long enough to get their lumps. And they're taking advice, that, so you've got ignorati at the top taking advice from ignoramuses at the bottom. It's just a perfect storm of stupid. Um, not that I have a strong opinion about that. Um, okay, so here's what's going on, and here's why I want to exp explain why we security practitioners' life is going to get substantially worse over the next 10 years. There's, there's, a trend, there's three trend lines which all point towards computer security getting crushed. This doesn't make me super happy, but you know, I'm gonna maneuver, so that's why I'm doing this talk. Maybe some of you will maneuver a little bit as well. We're getting crushed from the top, the bottom, and from the sides. And, and here's what it looks like. From the top, we're getting crushed by cloud computing, right? 
And the reason we're getting crushed by cloud computing is, is management cost. Man, executives are looking at the, the, the egregious cost, it's not our fault, but they're looking at the egregious cost of Windows desktop administration. Also, some, some idiots decided they were gonna do server stuff on Windows and they're looking at the egregious cost of that. Linux isn't exactly cheap either. Unix is horrific. Speaking as the old Vax cluster administrator, Unix is a piece of crap too. Um, but so what's happening is executive management is looking at all of this stuff and they're going, wait a minute, you told us that we were gonna materialize cost savings out of this computing stuff. And actually what you're doing is you're costing us more. The more computing we do, the more computing costs. The cloud guys are gonna kill computing because they're, well, they're, gonna, they're gonna absorb it, not kill it. They're gonna own it because they're saying, we're gonna aggregate administration costs so that you don't have to pay them anymore. You don't have to manage those Windows machines. You can simply have us manage them for you because we're gonna, be, we're gonna amortize the cost because we've got good systems administrators and we do things using lockstep configuration management practices, which is what you should be doing, but it's hard. We understand that. So that's why you should go to the cloud, right? So here's the, here's the way I look at this. Cloud computing is for people who don't know how to do computing, which is most people. So they should move to the cloud. I used to be very, very anti-cloud. I would go, no, don't, you're, you're crazy to go to the cloud. And then I would realize that I was talking to all of these executives who literally didn't understand what they needed to do in order to keep computing in-house. I mean, this, this is shocking. When you, when you read about these incidents that are happening with CryptoLocker, like, I mean, how many of you have gotten CryptoLocker? Okay, probably self-inflicted in this room. But, but when you get CryptoLocker, I, I don't know about you, but I mean, if I get CryptoLocker, I'm going to laugh, wipe my machine, and reload my stuff from the, the array of backup drives that sits next to my computer powered off when I'm not using them so that exactly that won't happen. And if something did happen to those, I would you know, drive into Clearfield with my vault key, go to the bank, take a bunch of hard drives out of my safe deposit box in the bank where I'm leveraging their fire suppression system for $29 a year, and I would restore from that. A like, crypto locker is, right? It's a little downtime if you're an idiot. It's a lot of downtime if you're a complete idiot. And then I started to realize, oh, all these people are getting crypto locker. It's because they're complete idiots. They should move to the cloud, right? Cloud is like, cloud is like a Macintosh. It's computing for people who don't know how to compute. And I have no problem, I have, I have no problem with that as long as you know what you're doing, right? So here's the thing, if, if, if executives can't do IT in-house, then they have to have someone else do it for them. They're now looking, the, so the first generation who got peeled off by the cloud were the companies that didn't know how to do computing and they moved it to the cloud because the cloud does it better. Now we're looking at the people who are going, wait a minute, we could save money by doing this. Now, that's also ignorance, but it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's short-term ignorance for about the next 15 years. Back in the 70s, which I, I do vaguely remember, although I was you know, a little back then, um, people were complaining about the cost of computing for a different reason. Because they had aggregated it all into big glass houses being run by IBM. And once IBM owned all their data, the prices went way up. And then that's what triggered the desktop revolution, which got us to the disaster where we are right now. The desktop revolution was all these people going to stupid executive management, going, oh, that mainframe's too expensive for you. All, those, all those, that, that stuff is really expensive. Why don't you just buy a PC and run it locally? Just run it in DBase 3, it'll be fine, right? And the secretary can run it, it's so easy, right? And people bought that. <laughs> yeah, anyway, okay, so from the bottom, Securities can get crushed by BYOD. Now, the reason that that is bad for us in security, it's not really good or bad, I shouldn't use that word, but what's gonna happen is the oxygen is gonna get sucked out. Because if, if endpoint devices become the user's problem, that is essentially management saying, endpoint management is not our problem anymore, which means that there will still be a security industry, but it will be all personal desktop security problems. So a lot of that's gonna get sucked out as well, which is interesting, right? Because if you look at, you look at the options that the security community has come up with for personal computing security, home, home security, it's, it's slim and none, right? 
When you step outside of corporate IT security, what you have is, do you run Norton? Because that's pretty much it, right? You run some kind of antivirus thing and Windows update and you get owned every so often. You know, you use the parental controls and all that kind of thing. So, so they're looking at the potential savings of BYOD. Any of us who understand the way data moves in an organization knows that BYOD is going to be a huge problem. Because what it really means is that people are going to take home, um, sorry, I just had an idea. I have to think, I, it distracted me. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to just drop this one. I have, to, I have to figure out how to weaponize it properly. But I was just realizing, you know that NSA contractor they found who took home 50 terabytes worth of stuff over the last 20 years? BYOD case study, right? Um, and, and that's really the issue because guys like that, that that's the future of BYOD. I mean, he did exactly. He brought his own devices. Uh, they just happen to be hard drives. Um, and from the side, we're getting squished by some new management models, which again, I think are good. But, but, but these could push security completely out of the way, right? Which is fine. But if you move to walled garden software, which isn't a bad idea, um, then the question is, what, what do I need? What do I need? configuration management on my desktop for? Because it is a self-configuration managed desktop. If you think about it from, and, and I'm, I'm kind of projecting my punch here, but um, all of this is about configuration management and administrative costs. And so when you buy an, an iPad, what you're buying is you're buying a device that already comes with configuration management baked in. And it's done for you by Apple. And most of us are willing to trust Apple's kind of sketchy attempts to keep malware out of their infrastructure. I'm not saying that it's great, it's better than Android, it's better, way better than Windows, right? Although they did put that stupid Apple Watch app in there that none of us asked for. Um, you know, but it is a configuration managed environment. And one of the possible things that could come along is this could just come and knock the whole security world into a, into a loop. I'll, I'll make a, a weird prognostication. If Microsoft doesn't have a decent response to the Apple walled garden software model, and their current response is, is like, if you thought that the Apple walled model was really nice and simple, well, we've got one that's way more complicated. Um, uh, thereby showing that they utterly don't get the point, right? If Microsoft isn't able to respond effectively to that with some sort of a walled garden model that is as simple as what Apple does, if not simpler, I think Microsoft might not even be around in 10 years, which is a crazy thing to say. Although 15 years ago, I predicted that Sun Microsystems wasn't gonna be around and now they're just a little pimple on the side of Oracle. So, you know, unfortunately, here's a problem. I didn't play, I didn't play my stock portfolio with that assumption. I just stayed in Cisco. <laughs> so anyway, um, <clears throat> so everything that I've been talking about here is about how security, the underlying things that are gonna change security, the underlying things that are gonna affect security are all driven by management costs. If you believe what I'm saying, that's got some profound implications for us. It's all configuration management, it's all system administration, right? So the Apple walled garden software model is configuration management baked in to your software runtime. Cloud computing is configuration management baked in and your unit of computing is now functioning machine under someone else's management that you don't have to worry about. The cloud is configuration management outsourced. And the way that it works is it's difficult, so we have smart people do that, but if you've got a configuration managed environment like Amazon has built, you know, or Google has built. You can have one system administrator manage practically a million machines, right? Uh, Rob Kolstad, back in the 80s, the, the late 80s, he used to talk about system administration fan out. It was how many machines can one system administrator manage? Now, Kolstad was working for Sun at the time, and he was talking about a highly efficient system administrator. One administrator could manage 25 workstations. Wow. Well, actually, you know, for 1985, 1986, that's pretty good. But now we're, we're at the point where 
you know, in Amazon Cloud, you're, you've got one system administrator. I don't even know how many machines they're managing per system administrator. That'd be an interesting question. Um, I'm try to mentally re bookmark that one to come back to. But this is all about system administration costs, right? So another thing that is, that is a problem, this may affect some of you in this room, currently security, especially in the US, uh, I'm not sure about in, in, in Europe, but there's a tremendous push for compliance and management frameworks around security. The basic thing that's going on there is management is saying, we spent all this money on systems and we're going to now try to legislate them into functioning correctly because we weren't able to discipline ourselves. We weren't able to discipline our IT, so now we're gonna have our auditors discipline IT for us. Which is kind of like, if you think about it that way, it's like bringing lawyers into any business practice and expecting it to get more efficient. Which is an utterly stupid idea. It's been a stupid idea all along. Um, I did a talk a couple of years ago where I, I went through the history of how the PCI standard was developed. And I don't think it sh should shock any of you to know that the reason that the PCI standard was developed and promoted was because it was developed by pen testers and auditors for pen testers and auditors. It's about separating customers from their money, not about making systems better. Okay, so it, the organizations that figure out that compliance is a problem are going to push compliance into the cloud. We're already seeing the beginning of this. And one of the things that's fascinating is that the cloud guys are already absorbing compliance. They're going, oh, compliance, that's no problem. If we think about PCI compliance, I'll build you a PCI compliant cloud. I've got configuration management tools. All I have to do is apply a different configuration doctrine and sell that to you for, for only 50% of what your current compliance costs are. They're gonna just laugh and they're gonna pocket that money because it's basically, it's basically free for them. But you know, that's how that's going to work. Um, so, how do we dig out of this hole and what are we going to do? We're going to have to stop doing penetration and patch. The industry, this is already happening. The industry has moved towards patch streaming. Patch, patch Tuesday, what the hell? What a completely stupid idea. Our software is so bad, we have to spin it down every week so we can patch it. I mean, just terrible software. Stop using terrible software. Um, it's heading this direction, but penetrate and patch is simply not going to be good enough. Right? It's, it's going to have too much bandwidth costs. The only place where it's going to work is on the BYOD front. Because the individuals who, you know, some, we're, we're okay with going to App Store and clicking update all. <laughs> that, that's not a cost that's too high for me to pay. Eventually that's gonna become a cost that's too high for, for me to pay, which is why we saw the IoT meltdown a couple of weeks ago, because uh, it is too high a cost to, to, to manage. If you want, by the way, if you want a really fun experience, talk to an operations specialist who does something like runs a casino about using IOT light bulbs in the casino. And if you survive the experience, it's because they were such a, they're, they're a nice person and they just laughed at you, right? Because, I mean, how many of you have got like a LifeX bulb or something like that? I had six, no? Okay, no? That's cool. Okay, so we don't have a lot of, of people who just kind of buy off of marketing. I did, I thought this is really cool, internet enabled light bulb, I'll be able to turn my light bulbs off from Austria. Um, unbelievable, I, for a brief period of time until I recovered, I was a systems administrator for six light bulbs. <laughs> so on top of the other eight machines in my house that I'm a systems administrator for, I've got you know, an open BSD, I've got a free BSD box, I've got an old Spark, I've got a bunch of PCs, and uh, you know, I suddenly was the administrator for six light bulbs. And the amazing thing was that those six light bulbs took more systems administration time than all the rest of my computing combined. <laughs> Because they'd update, you know, you must update, your, you must update your light bulb. Okay, now <laughs> go to the plant manager. Go to the plant manager for the Mirage Casino and say every Tuesday we must update the light bulbs. <laughs> and and they will call. They will call security. Now, see, they, Vegas has improved, right? In the old Vegas, they would have found you in four dumpsters different dumpsters. Um, but now in the new Vegas, you would be escorted out in a limo to you know, Tahoe, where you would be found in four different dumpsters. Um, so enough about that. You see, you see where I'm going with all of this, right? It's all about management costs. Because 
Computing has not delivered the operational efficiencies that it promised. And executives are looking at the, 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 the performance and improvement that they expected from computing and they're going, where are the cost savings? Instead of saving costs, we just have more fucking computer people. That's the problem, they wanna, they wanna get rid of us. So how to talk to management, how to fix this. Uh, joking aside, they're not really all stupid. Well, like 80%. Um, uh, I am a manager, so I, I throw myself under that bus. Um, not just all of them, but here's the way to talk to management. Computer people are always going, oh, we don't know how to talk to management. Here's how you talk to management. You have to use comparative metrics. You have to be able to compare your results to your projections. We security people have a terrible history of going into management and going, wah, we're gonna wind up leaking business records, whatever. And they just hear us going, blah, 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 blah. Because to them, we're about as smart as a dog because we don't communicate in a language that's useful. Now, if we come in and we say, um, we've been spending this amount of time on incident management related to this particular operating system and this particular set of practices. I would like to change the set of practices into this set of practices and I believe we'll be able to save that OPEX. Okay, uh, extra credit if you throw in OPEX or something like that because it sounds cool. Because um, you have to help them understand where the effort is going. You have to show them where the administrative time is going because that's what they're looking at, right? If, you, if, you, if you're a horrible person, all you have to do is come up with a plausible sounding lie for how you want to make a few changes that's going to allow them to, to outsource all of your jobs or get rid of half of your staff. Um, of course, you'll notice that nobody who ever recommends those changes is in the half that gets gotten rid of. Um, this is another one that comes up, executives all the time, they're, they're starting to realize that they've gotten bitten by the custom software development bug, and so they're pushing back against custom software. Here's how you push back against custom software. They go, we don't develop software in-house. Oh, yes you do. All of those Oracle applications did not spring full born from someplace. That's what the, that army of Oracle consultants that you hired do. So you do software development, you just do it by giving gym bags of money to Oracle consultants. So you gotta think about that and build that into your software development life cycle, right? Currently, your software development, and when you say this to executives, some of them, some of them will start to go, huh, and they'll look pissed off at the Oracle guys, right? You say, your software you have a software development life cycle. You think you don't develop software, but you have a software development life cycle. It looks like this. Give gym bags of money to Oracle consultants, run stuff, complain, give gym bags of money to Oracle consultants. Oracle comes out with a new version of software, give gym bags of money to Oracle consultants, repeat. That's your software development life cycle, right? And it sounds an awful lot like the software development life cycle that scares you, which is have a bunch of programmers, which cost gym bags of money, no question, right? But then you beat them and pound them directly because you own them and they fix stuff and you just do the beating and pounding without having to have Oracle consultants. See how that works? It's exactly the same. You've just decided where, whether the bags of money go into some place's hands that you control or whether they go into somebody else's hands. That's all. You gotta get them to understand this. Just look at top line management and maintenance costs. That's all you wanna look at and you're gonna have everything that you need. Um, this is a question we can't quite ask executives yet, but it's, it's close, right? Which is, why? I, I ask executives all the time, why aren't you using Macs instead of Windows? Oh, Macs aren't good for business. Really? Okay, I mean, I, I hate Apple stuff, says the guy with an iPhone and an iPad. Um, I, I hate it just because it's, it's ugly and dumb, but, uh, and way overpriced. But, but here's the thing, you know, the, the reason that a lot of executives don't wanna just give their employees Macs is because Apple's not good, it's not a good business platform. That's, that's all they know. And if they say something like that, the question you should ask them is you could say, and, and Microsoft exactly is how? how how's, how's that a good business platform? Right, this, is an operating environment that, this is an operating environment that comes with gigantic puzzle pieces missing for the vendor's convenience so they won't get sued again by the government for trying to do too much, right? So it's got these big holes in it and you have to buy it and then you have to spend hundreds of dollars in order to make it unholy or sorry, in order to make it less holy. No, in order to make it more whole free. Um, it's just saying holy in the words Microsoft together was hard. Um, but you know, how, how is this a good platform, right? And that's what they're looking at when they're comparing that to the cloud, 
Right? With the cloud, they just pick up the edge of the carpet, kick that all underneath, drop it back down, it's all taken care of. Right? So you need to ask management, look, is this worth it? Is it better to do something where we're able to have kind of a control, basic control structure around the runtime so we don't have to worry about malware? Or is it better to buy Windows, do Patch Tuesday, do antivirus, and do incident response? Which, one, which one's better? What, what the hell are you thinking, right? Because if their premise is that they're saving money, they're not saving money because they're constantly doing incident response and they're constantly hiring you know, penetration testers and doing vulnerability management. It's, it's completely bizarre to me. But anyway, so how do you do this? Maintain metrics. You have to start maintaining metrics. You have to be able to communicate to management using metrics, which means quantitative outcomes and measuring quantitative outcomes against past outcomes to be able to project future outcomes, right? Um, so if, if, yeah, if I can do my little Zen moment for when's the best time to plant a mighty oak tree? 50 years ago. Okay. When's the best time to start collecting metrics? Well, about two years ago. Right? And if you didn't, you're screwed. No. Um, the second best time is, is now. Right? Start collecting metrics now because in a year when you actually want to say, I'd like to make this change, and somebody says, oh, we can't make this change, well, you can actually come in with cost projections and say, you know, here, here, here's, some, here's some numbers. Um, this, is, this is kind of what's going on. I mean, my, a friend of mine who's the head of security for a major university in New York, um, you know, went to the, the management team of the university and said, um, let, me show you, uh, let me show you a couple of charts really quick. One is the incident rate on all the systems on our network. How many times we've had to do incident response related to security problems on our entire network? And this is, you know, bouncy chart. Now let me show you what it looks like in machines that are managed by IT, that are under configuration management by IT. Very small little line just bouncing up off the bottom. Now let me show you what it looks like with the faculty. It looks exactly the same line, right? So the faculty machines are the problem. Boom. Game, set, and match. That's how you do this kind of thing. You've got to come in with comparative metrics that allow you to say, if I factor the situation into these two different buckets, here's what it looks like. It's you can make this change, don't make this change, do this thing, don't do this thing. This is where the costs are, right? And that's how you talk to management. Okay, I'm almost done, actually. So if you're working in security, focus on management automation. If you really want to stay in security, work and stay purely in security, focus on security management and automation. But that's where it's going to be, right? If you're a pen tester, ask yourself, how do I pen test not, not 100,000 machines, but how do I pen test 1,000 networks? How can I do that automatically? I don't have an answer to that, by the way. Um, you know, right? Anything, think about any places where you can ditch existing management costs, that's where you're gonna wanna be. Um, any place where you can automate it, any place where you can aggregate it. I'll give you a few more specific ideas about that later. If you're working in software, same thing. Management automation for software. How do you improve software? Case tools were a horrible idea. Uh, I, I lived through those. I was a professional programmer in the late 80s and I had to deal with structured design methodologies until I was ready to shoot myself, literally. The idea of case tools was to make it so that it was harder to write bad code. We got that backwards. We should have been asking, how do we make it easier to write good code? <laughs> Whoops, what a simple mistake. Um, if you can figure out a way of letting people write good code faster, you'll get rich. If you can figure out a way of making it so that people can write a thousand applications in the amount of time it took for them to write one, you'll get rich. We'll have lots more shitty software. I mean, I don't mean shitty software like insecure bad software. I mean, we'll have you know 10 million dancing pigs applications, which is great because then we'll need, which is bizarre, right? Because actually we have that. You've got things like Unify, right, which allow anybody who does not know how to program to program. Okay, that's pretty cool. And so what we've got now is we've got 10 million crappy animated games that all look kind of the same. You know? And so that has spurred the development of a whole new infrastructure to allow people to rate crappy games so that you can actually look at 10 million crappy games and figure out which are the five worth playing. All right. So. I would stay away from forensic management fields. Forensic management is where you've got tools that allow you to figure out what the hell's actually on the network. Right? There's a lot of people using vulnerability management tools as forensic management tools. You come in, you run a vulnerability scan, just so you can figure out where all your wireless access points are. 
That is utterly lame. That is why, that is why management wants to push everything to the cloud, is because of exactly that. Their network guys built these gigantic networks that even they don't understand. Now, the person we should, the people we should blame is management, because management cheerfully wrote the checks for that, right? Huh, what do you want to do? Computing stuff. Oh, okay, that sounds great, here's a check. Right? That's basically what happened all through the 90s. Ooh, we grow our network 500% per year. Yeah, but what do you do with it? I don't know. We just grow it. That's what we do. We make it bigger. It's a good strategy. It worked for the dinosaurs. Um, but these are places I would sort of stay out of personally. Right? Um, they're going to be targeted for cost cutting. which is good. Well, Another way of thinking about it, by the way, I, should, I put that little comment in there. Right? There's two ways to think about it. One is it's going to be a field that's going to be targeted for cost cutting and downsizing. That may mean opportunity for you. Right? As the pool gets smaller and smaller, being the big shark in that pool is a good place to be. So if you're planning on, if you're planning on being in a segment of the industry that's going, to get that's going to get cost pressure, that means you have to be faster, smarter, and sharkier than everybody else, and you will do fine, you personally. Right? But think about it that way as far as, you know, I am going to be the absolute best at, you know, pen, pen testing thousands of, thousands of networks per year automatically, and I'm going to rake in big gym bags of cash, and then I'm going to buy a Ferrari and go do something else with my living, that, you know, what's left of my life. That's a decent strategy if you could pull it off. Um, uh, here's two ideas. I, help yourself to them if you want. I'm not going to do them because I'm busy with other stuff. But application whitelisting as a service is a huge possibility, right? And this is easy to do. Go buy one of those application whitelisting console systems. Go find 10 clients in the same vertical. Let's say you go to 10 banks, right? And say, we're going to amortize your whitelisting costs because we understand what's malware, what's not malware, what's normal banking applications. We'll manage your whitelist for you. All you have to do is put the, you know, put the, the whitelisting agent from whatever on your desktops, allow it to communicate to our operations center, and we'll manage it for all of you. That's all the cloud guys are doing. They're just aggregating management. Huge money opportunity there. Storage management as a service also. Another one would be cloud migration as a service, which is, which is another field that hasn't really kicked up yet. But somebody could do that really easily. Because there's going to be these translation things, right? How do you move somebody's entire application stack from one cloud service to another cloud service. And when you start thinking about that, you'll realize that the cloud services haven't really made it easy to do that. For obvious reasons, they haven't made it really easy to migrate from one cloud service to the other. So you can make a lot of money making it easy for people to migrate from one cloud service to another, and then all you have to do is cause interruptions here and there and cash in as you migrate people around to chase the interruptions you didn't cause. Um, okay, so <clears throat> I'm pretty much done. It sounds like I'm big on configuration management. I'm huge on configuration management. Configuration management is what, configuration management, automation management is what's going to separate the survivors from the wannabes. It's already really done that. The difference between Google and everybody else is that Google just nailed configuration, well, two things. Google nailed configuration management, and they're on top of the pipeline for commercial searching. Um, and here's, the, here's the, 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 the razor blade in the apple. I believe that security is not really a field. I've been working in it for a long time, but we really shouldn't exist as a separate field. We are a mistake that is a side effect of the fact that systems administrators suck and network administrators suck. And if they actually hadn't sucked, security would have never happened as a field. Software developers suck too. So we're kind of, security, if you think about it, security is this little carve out of suck in these three fields that really just should have done this stuff right, and then we wouldn't need to exist at all. And that's the reason we're going to come under pressure um, going forward. So how's that for a cheerful thought? Um, uh, should I just run away? Should I try some questions? Does anybody have a question? No? OK, good. Well, I'm going to run. I'll be around for the rest of the day also if you want to yell at me and tell me I'm an idiot. That's never happened before. <laughs> right, thank you for your time.